Greetings and welcome to this conversation with Roland Watson Grant, the best Jamaican writer you've probably never heard of, <clears throat> although he has two excellent novels to his credit. Roland, by way of introduction, your first novel, Sketcher, was published in 2013 by Alma Books, which you followed a couple of years later with the sequel to it called Skid. And that was, was that in 2015 or 2016? That was actually the following year. Um, oh, like, immediately. Oh, the 2014 then. That's right. It was um, as pretty much nine months after. I mean, I wow. Think I, had a, I had a manuscript nine months after. Right? Oh, my God. That's, so it was already in gestation then. That's right. that's right. Cool. And then since then, there's been a gap, uh, which you filled with short stories three of which we were privileged to publish at Pre. Thank you. Um, and uh, now your latest short story, The Disappearance of Mama Dell, has been shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Uh, you won the regional section of it, and the region includes Canada and the Caribbean. And this is a competition that, that gets thousands of entries from around the world. Yes. Right, I mean, so that's a big accomplishment and I want to congratulate you. You must be very pleased with this. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, yes, and the, and the results are going to be announced. The final you know, winner is going to be announced on Wednesday, the 30th of June, right? That's right, that's right. Um, and for all, you know, for, for what it's worth, I mean, the entire, the entire reset um, I believe of, of my, my, my writing journey, even up to this point has been wonderful. You know, Windsor's, Windsor's results um, will, will only help to bolster that. And, and I, 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 I'm not even describing a win. I'm just right. being able to be the regional winner and to represent the, the region um, you know, at that level. That by itself is a huge thing. So um, I wanted to say that, you know, I, I, I heard an earlier, or we had an earlier conversation in which you mentioned uh, that uh, seeing Ingrid Passard, the, uh, you know, the Trinidadian writer who lives in between Barbados and England, you, seeing her win the Global Commonwealth Short Story Prize a few years ago, uh, inspired you to enter this competition again, this time with a keener sense of strategy and knowledge of the kind of story you wanted to, to tell or to write. Uh, in, an, uh, in, an, you know, in another early interview, you mentioned growing up in a repair shop as the inspiration for your first novel, Sketcher, which is about a young boy whose brother has the power to fix things by drawing or sketching them to perfection. Yeah. So your first two novels, Sketcher and Skid, are both about the same woman-headed household of brothers and their mother living in the swamps around New Orleans. Yes. I believe you're quite unique in setting your novels abroad with very li little reference to Jamaica or the Caribbean, although that family, their origins were, you know, in the Caribbean, yes. in Jamaica to some extent. Um, right. With Mama Dell, like the stories you've published in Pre, are you returning to the Caribbean? Is it the I return of the prodigal? Are you literally pressing a reset button that is taking your writing career in new directions? I'm not finished with the questions. Are you also resetting your trajectory in the way you observe the patching and fixing of beautiful things in the repair shop of your childhood, mm -hmm. in the way that a surgeon might reset broken bones? Was there a break that needed resetting? Are you strategically resetting your career? Tell us more. What does reset look like for Roland Watson Grant? Thanks, thanks, Annie. I, I think um, that you you used a number of analogies, and I think all of them would be correct in one way or the other. Um, certainly in terms of the prodigal, uh, I've always considered myself prodigal. You know, I, I'm always returning to some place, uh, always um, going out into, uh, uh, on an adventure and then returning to, some, you know, from some place. Um, sometimes you get accepted back home. And, and other times, you know, um, other times, I, I imagine people are suspicious. I, I once went back to church, and and I think people were very suspicious of, me. Um, you know, if I if I had uh, qualified in terms of my my um, 
my righteousness or my morality to, to be among the congregation anymore. So I'm always returning to somewhere. Um, in this regard, I think since, since early, since late March, um, the return or the reset that I've done uh, as, a, as a prodigal, you could call it, has been overwhelming. There have been a number of people and it's, it's wonderful to hear people say, um, so how come I never heard about you? Um, where have you been? Uh, you know, those things to me are not um, doors being shut or, or a slight. I consider them an opportunity. I think a lot has changed since 2013 when my first novel came out. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is, I'm always the, the person who I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm only um, thinking of repairing a breach as it concerns my own writing journey, but also what are the possibilities that we have, what are the opportunities we have to repair maybe something that has been long broken or that has been long affected or long injured uh, in the sense of, are we, is there an, is, are there opportunities that we're not um, getting for our writers who actually live in the country, of, in their country of origin? So I've always said, if it, if it is about making history um, in the way that our sports figures have and our music figures have, and, and you know, um, the history of Jamaican art and Jamaican culture and how that has spread mm -hmm. from this rock into the world, uh, then I'm all for being a part of that uh, trajectory, all for being a part of that, that uh, you know, that entire history and culture. So I think, yes, I do consider myself a prodigal and also a repairer of, of, of the breach. And uh, I'm Wonderful. very appreciative. Uh, no, and, and why should you not have that ambition? It's, it's wonderful uh, to see somebody, to see a local writer reach so high, you know, and you know, many, it's an example for other writers in the region, because we're going to get to this later, you know, the fact that many good writers have had to leave. Yeah. And somehow we have to change that, right? But my next question is actually about something you touched on, which is religion. Mm -hmm. um, religion is not a subject that's commonly addressed by fiction writers. Yes. And, uh, you know, we recently learned from a wonderful article that you wrote for a travel magazine that your father was not only a CB radio whiz, he was also an Obia man. That's Obia right. being a form of popular religion here. Yes. In Mamadel, you deploy popular religion adeptly in sketching the character of the people of Rivergut yes. and the Church of the Living Drum. Did you grow up going to church? Are you Absolutely. religious yourself? Do you go Absolutely. to church? And if so, what kind of church do you go to? Um, I, you know, I, I spent 21 years in a fundamentalist church. Wow. Uh, 21 years. Uh, my, my mother was very adamant that we would attend church and that we would attend a particular church. Um, it's a fundamentalist church. I'm going to use the word Sabbatarian. Um, what does that mean? In, you know, it's a church. There are, there are a few denominations that... Um, have as a as a central part of their tenet, mm -hmm. the 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 keeping of Saturday as a holy day. Uh -huh. um, the, the, it is what it wasn't so much about the day that was that was uh, the fundamentalist part of it that um, brought us to 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 blows, if you would use that term. It was more of the other tenets that came with that uh, denomination that I had, and I think I began about age 15 to have to have issues with some of the, what I'm going to call extra biblical things that were uh, contained in the, in the set of beliefs. Mm -hmm. In terms of Mumadel and the, you know, the Church of the Living Drum, I've always been fascinated with, with, with how a, a denomination polices itself, mm -hmm. how a congregation polices itself and makes sure that the members are kept in line. Yes. Um, so, so I, I could relate to that and I could also relate to some of the things which were sacrosanct, which you do not um, break. Uh, for example, dietary laws and um, laws about alcohol and, and when it came on to the, the Sabbath itself, or, you know. So I grew up with that 21 years. Um, it wasn't a bad break 
from that congregation, but it certainly was something that you, you really have to look back at and ask yourself if you were living in a particular pigeonhole that kept you in one mindset and never made you expand your thinking. Um, expand your kept thinking. you cooped up, as it were. Kept you cooped up. And the worst thing about that was that it perhaps made you look at other human beings in a very skewed way. Hmm. If you wore jewelry, then you were other. Right. And if you, hmm. if you ate a particular thing, then you were other. And if you drank a particular thing, you were other. Um, and I found that to be, I couldn't recognize myself after a time. Because then as you, as you went out into the world and you started, you know, you, you had a corporate job and different things started, you realize that you are interacting with so many different people. Uh, what are you going to do at that point when you get the impression that you, you've been fed for mm -hmm. over a decade um, with something that tells you that everybody else is other and you are remnant? Right, right. And it's interesting because in in Mama Dell, there's the, the famous avocado tree that the people of River Gut are not supposed to eat from. <laughs> and that's, you know, it, it, you know, it's fascinating because it's, it's a way of maintaining your community, those uh, proscriptions, you know, don't do this, you can't eat that, just as you described with the church that you grew up in. So did that, does that mean that now uh, you don't belong to any church or do you belong to a different kind of church? Um, I, I don't belong to any church. Mm -hmm. I do think that there is very great value in, in um, being connected to something which is larger. Mm -hmm. I do have questions. I do have many questions. Um, right. There are things that, uh, fascinate, that fascinate me beyond what we can calculate and what we can find an empirical, mm -hmm. empirical data to support. So sure. you ask yeah. questions. But I think, as I said in the in the article about phobia, that I do give these things a half hug, where you know I, I half hug the things which are inexplicable, um, while being very scientific minded about other things, because somehow I know what I've seen, I know yes. I you know, mm -hmm. certainly you know what I refuse to believe, but I know I saw it, um, and somehow I think this is the space mm -hmm. where these stories come from. Right, it's, exactly. It's, it's coming from where you mm. do not get a, a set answer. So you have to kind of say, well, look, I'm going to put the question out there. Maybe someone else would answer it for me. You know? Yeah. And you capture that very beautifully in this story because uh, there is this clash between, you know, this insistence and this firm belief that somehow, you, you know, if you, if you eat from that tree, that uh, eat a avocado pear from that particular tree, you might. It, it's almost like Adam and Eve, you know, eating the right. apple. It's, it's, it's presented as that kind of huge, almost sin or That's crime. Right. However, it turns out that the people have been eating the pears all along without realizing it. And so you are juxtaposing science in a way with science or, you know, with, yes. um, or with belief, you know, the power of belief. That's right. That's so right. that's very interesting. And um, what about the last 10 years? Uh, what, what, what would you say your personal highlights have been? And could we ask if you're working on a new novel? Absolutely. I could start there, but let me let, let, me let you finish your question. No, actually, that is the short question. This okay. one is a short question. OK. Um, I entered Commonwealth. Uh, for two reasons. One was, I mean, as I said, Commonwealth is a platform where cultures have conversation. I'm very interested in how cultures have conversation, um, how similar we are and how different we are. And um, Remy Gamiji and myself, who's my, my fellow finalist, um, have been having very interesting conversations about Namibia. Oh. Uh, you know, we, we speak from the rock. Is that where Remy is from? He's from Namibia. Namibia. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's incredible because he uses he uses all the Jamaican terms, wow. uh, you, you know, and, and we speak, we say, we say you, and I call him you, um, we say brethren, and he is very, I don't know that he realizes how very adept he is with the Jamaican uh, language. I mean, is, is this coming from an engagement with Jamaican music? 
and culture yeah, on, his, on his I, part? That's right. Well, I, and I asked him this morning. It, it may very well be the news, but I asked him this morning. I didn't make a contingency. Um, you know, where you're, you, you have this whole massive in, in Namibia who's teaching all these things. Um, and he hasn't responded yet. So, you know, I can <laughs> But um, that conversation and, and how you know many British um, persons who live close to or, or are descendants of Jamaicans say particular things. It's interesting how, how that becomes uh, a, a force to reckon with and how that spreads and, and what, what happens from that. I find that that both you know, geographically or time-wise if there is something that we can learn from going to a museum and, and seeing something that was made, a sarcophagus, for example, how incredible it is that we learn more about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I just find that sort of um, focus on writing from that angle to be mm -hmm. very interesting. I had to do that with SketchUp in 2013. Um, as soon as I realized I, I had a book deal, I said, well, now I need to fall back on my Caribbean um, understanding of religion and of folk uh, belief, and I went into you know the stuff that I learned from my from my father, and the, the stuff I grew up with. That was a I think SketchUp was perhaps the first highlight, um, just to see the get when you when you actually get the the first. I remember I was in a New York hotel, and um, my editor came in and he said, you know, these are the these are the the galleys that the, the galleys I think. Were. Um, he put the pages down in front of me and said, well, you know, I'm going downtown. You read through it and tell me if you have, you know, any issues. And I'm reading through these page by page and I'm grinning and I'm wondering if the, if the concierge is looking at me kind of weird. It's just, you know, what am I reading? <laughs> I was excited about seeing that. I wasn't, I wasn't that, I wasn't as excited when I actually saw it between covers. I was really? more seeing this thing. The galley my, proofs, yeah. And I'm reading it. And these are my words popping off the page, but speaking to me, Skid Beaumont is speaking to me in a way that I don't recognize him as a person that I invented. I'm seeing this yeah. at his story. And that's what a start, great experience. Yeah. Absolutely. So when mm -hmm. you start getting compassion for the character, uh, and, and I think I learned a lot about my own growing up at that time. Um, one review, I called it a, a really a, a happy, sad story or a hilariously sad story. Mm. And I realized that while growing up, we never thought of our life as sad. No. I realized mm. there were a number of things which were, um, which were, we, we were, we didn't have the opportunity. Right. But it was interesting to realize that you think of it as an adventure until later on mm. in life, you start seeing that there are inequities, yes. in, yes. inequities in opportunities, inequities. And that's when the sadness probably came when you said, well, how do I now fold this over into a novel when I finally get to it? Yeah, yeah. So sketches uh, reading the first Gallup book in New York. Um, and then when Skid came out and right after that came the translations from Turkey and from Spain within the wow. same. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was the second highlight um, Great. of Spain. Yeah. Right? I made friends from, um, from Istanbul hmm. uh, who just said, we heard the story at, a, at a, a festival. And once we heard a story, we said, no, we have to have that in Turkish. Um, mm. I do not know why that was a connecting. But uh, clearly they identified with it in some way. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. Yeah. And then you had to now go back through the translations with the translator to make sure that you were doing the, 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 the correct things in terms of nuances. Sure, yeah. Um, there were descriptions of angels, for example, that, that may have been um, not, not something that was appreciated or accepted by, mm -hmm. by some, um, some forms of Islam. Okay. And therefore, we had, mm -hmm. we had to retrace how we describe those angels. Oh, yes, because Turkey is, is an Islamic country. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. With the Spanish translation, we had to make sure that a Kayman or a Kayman, uh, I'm not quite sure of the pronunciation, was indeed in line with what we considered uh, to be alligators or crocodiles, etc. Okay. And, and, mm. that, and that all those nuances with the languages came out. And Celia, Celia Montoli, I think uh, the translator's name was from Madrid. Um, she was she was very helpful in in breaking down the nuances. So we had a lot of conversation with us. So, so the translations were a, were a big highlight. Um, I think after that, 
after that, I there was a, a, an entire um, deal or a, 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 we were trying to we were trying to put Kid Sketcher and the new novel mm-hmm. in one big volume mm-hmm. that had all three in it. Uh, that didn't oh. work. We, we, we had we had a, a, a cover. oh so there's a sequel to Skid. There's a sequel to Skid. There's oh, a, there's a finale. Finale, uh, yes. Which is exactly what I'm working on now, which, is, okay. which, I'm, which I'm finished. So the idea was to put them all in one volume. Right. Sketch and, and uh, another one that was uh, supposed to be called Nearly Near or Fairly Far, something like that, uh, which we, it didn't work out. At the time, I got a spinal injury. Oh. And if you ever have the impression that spinal injuries is basically musculoskeletal, then you make a mistake. What it actually does is that it affects your thinking. It does? It, it's a, because it's all central nervous system and the connection to the brain, mm. etc. I found myself not being able to process thoughts. Wow. Clear, clear thought. Mm. Um, this was 20, early, early 20, early 20, 2015. It was after wow. Calabria. Okay. Early um, fell off. I was, I was picking a, a, a mango for my son. Fell over a garden wall. Basically, I'm going to call it cocoa bread. <laughs> over a, cocoa breaded yes. over a garden wall. And um, didn't think any, anything of it because, you know, Jamaican man, hey, look, you know, you, you drop all the time, you get up and you keep going. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. The following year is when it affected me. What? So I had a, a seizure, seizure in terms of muscular seizure, couldn't walk. Mm-hmm. It up was pretty much paralyzed. The, the How ambulance. frightening! Absolutely. Um, and after that, it was it was a residual effect of that um, that was most scary because you find your faculties in terms of how you think being affected by this. Um, and it, it was explained to me by a neurosurgeon who eventually told me, "Listen, you're not going to need a two point five million dollar surgery. What you're going to need a lot of rest." Oh, yeah. And you, you need to rest and you should tell me if you have neuropathy or if you feel any tingling or if you mm-hmm. have racing thoughts or thoughts that you know don't connect. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have the latter. Mm-hmm. Thoughts that just wouldn't connect. And um, wow. mm-hmm. I caught once or twice and said, well, this is what you need to do. You know? So while there is repair that your body can do in some respects, you, you have to be very careful about making sure the body can do that repair. Yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. So I wrote two manuscripts. I, th- I think I'd probably say three manuscripts um, for the for the the finale of the Swamp Trilogy. Wow. Um, mm. You know, I heard Chimamanda say recently at, at a, I was watching a video where she said um, at, at um, Harvard, she was giving the speech and she said mm-hmm. she's happy her first novel never came out. Okay, yes. <laughs> He's happy. She, she's grateful. So he said, no, you need to stand back and not mm. let that will come out. But he was excited that it didn't come out um, because he said it, it, it would have been rubbish. Mm. Uh, those two manuscripts that I wrote after my spinal injury, pushing forward like I did before within you know, nine mm. months after, after nine months you know, I did sketch her in nine months, and I'm going to try to do skid in nine months again, and you know all that stuff. And my editor was very excited about that. Like, you know, you're a machine. Maybe I got slowed down. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, um, I, I remember one one person. I, I remember. I think I think Kerry Magnus. Kerry, uh, Kerry, Kelly Magnus. Said to Kelly, me, yes, Kelly Magnus. She said, me, she said to me after two, "You need to slow down." She mm. Said that. Mm. And I probably probably wondered why, but you know, um, yeah. you know the toll that it takes on you after a while. But I mm. think that freedom of the injury. And when I saw how exactly those two manuscripts went everywhere instead of forward, the, these were eighty thousand and a hundred thousand words long. And I said, well, okay, well this won't work. Um, I knew what my editor was going to say. I, I knew what the, the team of editors, uh, I knew what they were going to say. And pretty much I agreed with them. It, it, it's not heading in the direction. So I think that's also a highlight. 
where something said, well, okay, Roland, you need, you need, you need to, to slow down, literally, yes. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. where I went to, well, what's my first strength? My first strength is that I cut my teeth on, on competition, which is mm -hmm. story competition. Uh, Sketch was a short story. That's right, yes. And 2011, you entered a competition. So Sketch yes. is a short mm -hmm. story. Sketch was full of holes, it was a short story. But um, the voice was always the strongest part. So when it, mm -hmm. when it went to voice, I wrote six stories and sent to a competition that allowed you to do that. And when I, when I started writing Skid, it was the last, started writing Sketch, it was the last story I wrote. And the voice of Skid just came to me as a very rebellious version of what I should have said when I was nine years old. <laughs> and what I should have told my fundamentalist people when I was nine years old. Oh. And how I should have yes. said that. I hated bananas, I hated ripe bananas, and I hated the fact that you have all these cereals which taste like, like <laughs> hard. Um, I hate yeah. ripe bananas too, incidentally, yeah. Right? Um, just <laughs> yeah. All, all this stuff, and you, and you can't have a Pepsi, and you can't have a Coke, and you mustn't drink coffee, and, you know. Um, and he was just rebellious in his voice, and I just I just loved the character. As soon as I wrote the first couple of paragraphs, I said, this is, this is exactly who I wished I was. And it was <laughs> like the because I was a teacher at school, like you wish you had told her you felt. So it was a highlight to realize the manuscripts weren't working. Yeah. And to step mm -hmm. back for a second and, and say to myself, okay, well, you know, how do we, what exactly do I need to do now? How do and you that, fix this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you fix that? And that's where Percy and Mrs. Murphy came from. Um, that's where what came from? First thing, Mrs. Murphy. Ah, yes, yes, Mrs. which we published in pre, yes. That's right. And, and was so nominated. did that come before the one about uh, uh, the um, downtown? What, what's the first yes. one that yes. we published called? Um, every Everybody Live Uptown Now. Everybody Live Uptown Now. But the other one, Cursing Mrs. Murphy, was written before that? Yes. Ah, so, interesting. And, and it's funny because, again, still being affected by the injury, mm. I took to write cursing Mrs. Murphy. How, how long? Two years? Two years. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Compared to two years of writing a short story with nine months of writing a novel. Yeah. 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 So Quite a change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Two years. Um, and apart from me having to be very gentle with my writing and with my mind, um, I also, it, it had a very um, serious emotional connection, Cursing Mrs. Murphy, because it was actually based on my sister. Oh. Um, my, my sister, who's now deceased, uh, she had, she had um, some issues with a condition called uh, Pick's disease, which mm -hmm. is very rare, but it affects your central nervous system. Oh. Or therefore, you know, the, the permutations for a, an, an existence where you think that the breeze from the fan mm -hmm. is actually irritant and the clothes on your back you like steel wool, you know, and they, you know, wow. those are, so, so it's a they, hypersensitivity to anything. Mm -hmm. And and there was this whole there's this whole notion in 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 I would believe the Caribbean, but I can speak for Jamaica uh, without making a mistake, where we think everything that has to do with a CNS issue, a central nervous system issue, means the person is is um is mentally unstable. What? So they so they took her and she had an episode. Oh no! Mm -hmm. her, her to to Bellevue and they had her at Bellevue. I had to go to Bellevue to visit her. Um, lots of stories come out of those things. Mm -hmm. I had to visit her and she said to me very clearly, and this is a vice principal of a of a school at that point. She wow. was vice principal. She's brilliant. Mm -hmm. She's the kind of person who would watch my interviews and say, or read my interviews as well and say, well, you made a grammatical error here and here and here. So you need right. to make, when you're interviewed, you fix that. <laughs> and she older than the brothers? I mean, you don't mention, yeah, she's my older, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I hate the term half sister because I don't know what that means. No, mm -hmm, I know, so, okay. She was my mother's child, not my father's child. So she, um, she, but we're very close. She's the first one. I'm the last child. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're very close. She went to look for her in in, uh, in uh, Bellevue because at, the, at that point, all of my brothers had had migrated. Oh. And my mother was also overseas. Mm -hmm. I went to look for her. She does. She looks like a shell of herself, and she says to me, um, "You need to help me get out of this body." 
out of this body. Wow. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's um, amazing. Yeah. You know, so that emotional toll of mm. that, and then she, she died soon after. And that was, to me, I was relieved when she died. Because oh, you she was were. Dead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that went into person Murphy. The whole notion of how dare you assume what a person is going through when they decide to try to take the life. Mm, yeah. Now, now this is not from any moral perspective where I'm saying, okay, well, I understand because at that point I had just learned that lesson. Watching my sister diminish. Yeah. Mm. Uh, somebody who's cerebral, somebody who's conscientious, somebody who encouraged me, somebody who's religious, by the way, because she was very Catholic. She said, wow. you have to get out of the body. She, she couldn't do it anymore. So mm. Rowena Murphy, who is the lead character in Person Mrs. Murphy, I just, I had a, even though she wasn't in the story, only her action was in the story. I found an affinity with her. Yes. And mm -hmm. she, was based, she was definitely based on my sister. What was uh, your sister's name? My sister was Valerie. Valerie. Mm. Valerie, which also is half of the main character in, in, in SketchUp. It was okay. Valerie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that character is probably my mother and my sister in, in one person. Um, my mother has very few vices and, and that doesn't make very interesting characters. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I had to, to, to get a character with more vices if, if it's even to tell you that your grandma was incorrect or something. Like that. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. so, but it sounds um, like your sister was your mother and or mothered you in some ways. Absolutely. Yeah. De definitely. She was a disciplinarian. Um, her son is now, you know, her son is probably now 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can see the result of, of who she was in him. Mm -hmm. um, so, so going back to the short story was a highlight as well. I think first Mrs. Murphy took me a while, but when that got shortlisted in 2017, I said, well, you know, well, I'm back. You know, I, 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 felt, I felt good Fabulous. about it. Fabulous. Um, 2018, Moscow Awards. Um, yes. Maybe if my maybe maybe if there were there weren't more people there who knew me, maybe I would have shed a tear, you know, because there, oh, there are a number of things. Yeah. A number of things um, occurred there, and I and I hope that in the future that some of these things don't matter anymore. But mm. writers must write what writers are inspired to write. When Sketcher was launched, somebody said to me, somebody walked up to me at the at the at the it was Kingston Book Festival, and mm -hmm. they said. So what's the book about? And it, you know, all, all the books are on a screen and mm -hmm. etc. Um, and they said, um, so what's sketch about? I said, you know, it's about a second generation Caribbean boy growing mm -hmm. up in Louisiana swamps and, and, and learning more about his Caribbean um, origin through practices that his mother does, you know, her, yeah. her Caribbean hoodoo, etc. And the person said, you're a Caribbean writer? And she kissed her teeth and walked away from me. And when wow. she, she went to get a glass of wine and she couldn't understand it. She, <laughs> she, she gave me the side eye the, the whole time. Uh, the I wonder what she was reacting to. What was uh, just just the fact that you know you look on the liner notes on the back of the book and it says Louisiana and you're uh, right, and you're, right. As we said, as we discussed earlier, you, you didn't set the book here. So but what is this obsession that you know Caribbean writers have to only write about the Caribbean? What's interesting is that while I was doing research for that, it was all of my research came from Jamaica. Yes. And you were uh, essentially writing about Jamaica, but it was set in the, in Louisiana. That's right. We, because all Parts of my of it. Mm -hmm. right, all of my family were in the South yeah. by the time. Um, I knew of my of my father's ventures there. Mm -hmm. And also just the just the, the whole connection. Which is debatable, but the connection between Chris Blackwell and Bob Marley and the Imperial Records that, that were being listened to in terms of the blues, mm -hmm. when when his version of what we now know as reggae um, was formed, and again that's debatable. Right. But all right. of those connections and the food and the culinary. No, things, but there are connections between the Southern United United States and the Caribbean. You know, sailors used to bring songs, ditties from the U.S here and take back songs from here to there you know so there's a lot of uh, if you visit new orleans you can you can you feel like you're in the caribbean, in the caribbean. um 
one of the Neville brothers called New Orleans, the northernmost uh, Caribbean city. Yes. You know, yes. Um, mm -hmm. there, there is that and, and the connection between Barbados and the South where even Native American Indians were in Barbados. So that, you know, that, that's a yeah. whole other uh, uh, discussion. But when researching for Sketch and, and, and realizing the connections, I was very excited about those connections. Even with seeing Taino artifacts in Jamaica um, and how those pre-Columbian um, gods and, and, and goddesses and the things they did and the practices they did, how very important those things are to our understanding of being called Jamaica, you know? Yeah. Um, because we are wearing the identity of, of those who were here before us. Mm. We call ourselves Jamaica. You know? So um, that in itself um, was was also a, a highlight, but I think, I think I'm think i trying to remind myself of your question. Uh, the question was just about whether you're writing another novel and we, you've discussed that already. Uh, right. You said you've written two actually, <laughs> but right. that period of illness and spinal disintegration uh, affected your writing for a while. So yeah, you have, I have a, I can move on to my next um, question, which is quite different. Um, here, yeah. So uh, if you've noticed, several Caribbean writers are very promiscuous in their writing practice, meaning mm -hmm. that they, they've produced across the spectrum of literary genres. Right. For example, Kai Miller, Kwame Dawes, Olive Senior, they've not restricted themselves to any one genre, but write or have written fiction, poetry, plays, nonfiction. You know, so I'm wondering, uh, do you feel the desire to move beyond fiction or are you more or less mono, 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 monogamous, monogamous in this respect? No, absolutely. I mean, you, you, just called, you just called four of my heroes. So yes, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, definitely. And I think that after like 10 years after I made a decision, because it, it, I haven't been published for 10 years yet. I mean, I, I think SketchUp becomes um, eight years old this year or something. Right. Uh, but I made a decision 10 years ago um, on the 1st of January, 2011 to, to start writing because, because of a, a, an article I read in Details Magazine where Bono from U2, he said, if you're, if you're a musician and you don't go to the studio and you have no ambition, you're lying to yourself. Mm. So if I was a writer and I know I have the talent to write and I'm not writing to, to seriously have global impact, then I'm lying to myself. Yes. Persons mm -hmm. who tell me that they want a, that they want a, a mentor and they haven't written a paragraph, you don't need a mentor. You need to no. begin. You need to write. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so and also that global scale is very important. What I find with a lot of people is that they say, "Oh, we just want to write for our local audience." <laughs> well, that's sorry, but you know that's fine. But you also with Kai Miller does that, right? But he also does that after proving that he can write for glo you know, with a global impact. Yeah. And that makes that, that perspective, that change of perspective and that having proven yourself on a global stage yeah. makes all the difference. It's when we don't push ourselves and our, our horizons are always local or only local, I should say, that can be a problem. Absolutely, because they end up writing about a banker basket and three donkeys and everything that is the cliches of what we think. And not in an illuminating way. I mean, you could you could write about all those things and yet make them amazing and That's right. uh, extraordinary. Yeah. That's right. What perspective are you looking at them? You know, from or with? From, yeah. Um, so, so um, with definitely with the reset. When I when I thought about the notion of reset. Um, I said, well, reset is going to be, I set plans every year for what my writing, what my writing itinerary. Oh, you do looks. that. Yes. So, so, so it will look like, even if I said I'm writing two stories and I want one to be in pre. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know what pre's, um, I don't know what pre's. Theme uh, is going to be. Yeah. Going to be, but I'm going to, you know. Um, so I said, okay, two, two short stories this year. And I'm not right. pushing. I can go to five short stories a year. But I'm going to take my time with making sure that they each one is absolute, yeah absolute, mm -hmm. right um and then I'll say I also want to write a, a movie script 
I want to write some nonfiction, what form the nonfiction is going to take, I'm not sure of it. But I do that. Um, last year was a preparation. And this year, all of what is happening with the, 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 the sort of impact that's happening on social media and, and um, with the Commonwealth and with the um, article, the nonfiction article is surprising, but certainly it's something that it's, it's happening in a way that I wanted it to happen but it's very surprising. So nonfiction, a nonfiction article, the travel articles that pretty much fell in my lap. You were, you were there when um, yes. uh, Afar Media came searching. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That was an opportunity I was waiting for for five years. Right. What was uh, the name of the magazine again? So it's called Afar Magazine. Um, Afar, right. Um, Afar Magazine, also San Francisco, I believe. Um, yes, but, that's right, yeah. Yes, yes, uh, I'm, uh, Afar Magazine contacted me as editor in chief of Pre, and asked if I would recommend a writer for some work that they needed, they wanted, done, and I immediately thought of you. And was this the second story you did for them? This was the second article. Uh, the first one was the first one. The first one was actually written second. The first one that was published. Uh -huh. Okay. And it was good that things converged in terms of Commonwealth converging with the article right. being released because. The response to the nonfiction article, um, Lessons from an Oberman's Son, or well, oh, it's, uh, that's such a great title and a brilliant article, by the way. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Annie. Um, it was a, it was a pleasure working with the editors at mm -hmm. Afar Magazine. Um, the suggestions that were made, the questions that were asked, they basically said, "You tell us how this works." Yeah. And then we we'll tell you in terms of the edit what we think is best to bring out what you just told us and schooled us about. Mm. Amazing experience. I learned, I think I learned, I think I've learned from interactions with everybody, including yourself. Marlon James called me um, one day, I was writing something for him for, for Dave Eggers at the time. Oh, uh -huh. Yes. The project never happened, but he called me in the snow on Skype. And <laughs> he just, what Marlon said to me was, Okay, with this story, and it's funny because that was actually cursing Mrs. Murphy mm. it, in its original form. Oh, I, he said, I don't think you need that paragraph. I don't think you need that paragraph. You don't need that paragraph. But he said, to edit, not to oh. write. Oh. Like these three paragraphs out, and I read it over, and I was like, it's brilliant. Choirs. Yes. Okay. This dude pretty much took out stuff without looking at the material in front of him while he was talking to me, and the thing sang. Amazing, and then, yeah. And then Ayanna Julian Lloyd mm -hmm. uh, also looked at Percy and Mrs. Murphy, made a few suggestions just in terms of brevity. Right. That was it. So when it when it um, was shortlisted, I wasn't very surprised. I wasn't very surprised that it shortlisted. No, you, you knew what you were doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gone through the fire as well. Um, so... Did you freeze, Roland? Right, I just had to pause for a minute because I didn't know what happened. But you know, the, our, unfortunately, our yeah, your internet connection is unstable, it says. Yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that, but um, where were we? So we were talking uh, about- Alan James. Right. So, so just, just the, the, the contribution of uh, what many, many writers have done, um, both contemporary writers and, and those who were before in Jamaica, have influenced what I'm writing and, the, and the, 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 the diet of what I think I'll write from now on. So there's definitely going to be more essays to answer your question in, in short fashion. Definitely Wonderful. going to be more essays. Um, I'm currently writing an essay that has to do with growing up in the 80s. Um, and certainly having to fill the holes as you grew up with understanding what was happening in the 80s. Um, because all you saw was you know, at, at three or four years old, what you saw was what you didn't understand. No, so, I can so. imagine. And writing helps to clarify things. Absolutely. Doesn't it? I mean, if you do it well and you do it, um, yeah, Absolutely. properly, so, as so to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. go on. So what I've discovered. Are you gone again? No, I'm. I'm still here. Okay. Mm -hmm. You froze for a second. 
What I've discovered as well with um, Lessons from an Obia Man's Son is that there's a completely different audience or an audience that overlaps with fiction who's reading that. The, the persons who have made contact, the, the, the persons who are politicians and the persons who are who have interest in you know um, civic matters, the persons who are interested in religion, the Hoodoo persons. I mean, right now, the, the, and when I say the Hoodoo persons, yeah. <laughs> I mean people who are very interested in me doing spells for them. Now, that's interesting. That's are you very, serious? I'm serious. So I have a very interesting DM right now, and I I, I love all of them. So I, you know, <laughs> they'll always be protected. It's not a problem. Um, but it's interesting that there are there's such a global, and this is from four continents. Mm. There's a global response from something like lessons from an older man's son, where I'm being asked specific questions, and where I have paragraphs that go on that can fill four pages wow. um, mm -hmm. of a of a you know four four um, lecture size pages. Mm. The response from different kinds of people, from people in government, um, from people who run museums, is not something I expected with fiction. Really? But people in government? What do you no. mean? Um, well, the, the part in the article that speaks to um, the, the first proscription happening in 1898, and then now we're having this discussion mm. with the later administration of whether Obia should be legalized or not. Oh, yes, I, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that, that, I think that is the part that made it interesting. And it's, it's funny because it was actually a suggestion from the editor, Aislinn Green of, of Afar magazine, mm -hmm. brilliant, who said, you know, let's, let's give a background to when this began. And I said, well, okay, that's interesting. I can give you many things about when this yeah, began. Yeah. About, you know, the, the, the connection with slavery. Um, and it was that part that is the connecting tendon with, okay, what's happening now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of saying we should. Um, They're trying to uh, legalize it. Yes. Um, so that's where I think the interest from mm, government, obviously. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how much people like the writing style. I didn't. I actually, at some point, I'm really not trying to be funny. <laughs> I, <I'm, laughs> you're just writing. You're telling it like it is. Yeah. Um, when people start start uh, responding to the taxi man wearing a guard ring and the, and the Bible being crispy on the on the dashboard of the taxi, <laughs> uh, I'm describing. I'm not even trying to be funny. Yeah. Um, but the response for that uh, is res is reciprocal when it comes on to now the same people now demanding fiction, and I think that's something that we can we can look at. Annie, mm -hmm. And you have maybe you certainly with your background have seen that that persons who would not normally, in my experience, persons who are now following me um, and who ask for writing, and I certainly mm -hmm. see and send them uh, free links all the time. People from Canada, people who say, listen, I'm, I'm six years old, and I should have been writing a long time ago. I'm inspired. I'm mm -hmm. to write, I'm inspired to know, you know? When they say, okay, I've read your short fiction. I, 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 somebody sent it to me. I've read it. I'm reaching out to you right now. Where can I find more of your writing? I said, well, I have some fiction. I don't have a lot of nonfiction. I have some fiction. I said, well, let me see the fiction. And they'll read Cursing Mrs. Murphy or they'll read Everybody Live Up Town Now and then comes Commonwealth and then Granta prints the thing. And once right. Granta prints the, prints, um, the disciplines of Momadale, they're reading that and they're sharing that as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think somewhere along the line um, with the people who we know um, in, in Kingston, maybe mm -hmm. there is some formula there that we're all learning about how to how to sell, uh, to use a term, um, fiction. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. How do we now use these these things that we've learned, these key learnings? Yes, to, yes. To, to see how we can actually um, give it even more of a presence. Wonderful. So, yeah, that kind of runs into my next question, which was going to be, what have you learned? But this yeah. is what you've been talking about. Yeah. But what lessons are useful? for other emerging writers and artists who want to chart their course as writers? What are the tri and also another related question, what are the triumphs and tragedies locally in literature over the last 10 years? 
Yes, I think that, first of all, and I, and I, I said this recently, it's, it's probably only, the only re repeated thing I'm going to say in this interview. Mm -hmm. If you're going to write, um, you have to have the emotional energy to do it. If you don't love it, don't. Um, if you're not going to walk around with a notebook and take notes about things that inspired during the day, you're not going to have enough fuel to do what you need to do at night and then still either keep your nine to five or, 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 keep, your, or keep your sanity. Uh, these characters will drive you crazy. Do you have a nine to five? Absolutely. I, I'm still I'm still in advertising. I'm still the head of an um, advertising agency. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. that, the, that is a part of the JM Group. And What's it called? It's it's called the Creative Unit. Oh. It's part of the JM Group, and therefore, I have my obligations, you know, at work as well. So don't tell me you're still writing at three a.m. in the morning. Well, less now than before. Oh. Right. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not in my 30s anymore. So <laughs> certainly, certainly you have to um, figure out ways of how to balance it. But as you grow older, your perspectives either change or you get new perspectives and you perhaps become braver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, none of, these, none of these things that inspire are going to go away. So you certainly have to start now figuring out, well, where do I find the time to put these things down? You know, yes. um, and therefore you write more notes and you pack them in a folder and you say, I'll get you in two years. And I, I make promises to, to my concepts. I say, I'll talk to you in two years. <laughs> That's hilarious. And then, you know, um, I now have two more ideas for novels that are jumping in front of my current manuscript. And I have to say, okay, I'll see you in two years. You know? Right, right, right. Um, so I've learned that, you, it, you know, I, I have no regrets. Um, about my my beginning, mm -hmm. I think it was a it was a miraculous beginning. Um, I don't think anybody expects that it's even real that you, I could go on Google in 2011 and search for international literary prizes, and the first one clicked, I clicked on it, and there came Lightship, and I just entered that and entered six pieces, and then they called me. That's how it happened. Wow! Mm -hmm. Exactly, how it happened. I just said. Just like, just like Bono said, you have ambitions of being a writer, let's go write. So I said, well, literary mm -hmm. content, where it's at. Um, mm -hmm. I probably had seen um, Commonwealth before that because because Commonwealth had changed in Yes, it changed. It used to be um, like a flash fiction competition. Right. Then it was, there was a book competition, first book, I don't know, something. But now it's, then it became a short story competition. That's right. So I, I perhaps tried Commonwealth a long time ago, mm. and I maybe didn't understand GMT, like, you know, <laughs> Greenish. Greenish <laughs> I think I entered late. I think Kevin Jared Hussein said that to me once, and he also entered late and, mm. and didn't make it. Um, but it, it, the story wasn't very good. That, yeah. that first trade with Commonwealth wasn't very good at all. Okay. I mean, you know, um, and I I realized that uh, after that um, that entry, then it was time to you know start start building in, in a different way. What does it mean to write? I mean, the lessons I've learned, having gone into the light trip competition in, in 2011 and having gotten a book deal, etc. While those things are, are, are very interesting and I spent my own money going on a plane, taking two planes and two trains to go to a hall. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and sleeping in Manchester airport, which was, <laughs> also an experience, but I had these anthologies in my bag with my short story in it. Mm -hmm. That was the whole for the, Wow. Um, I think that the main lesson from that is even if you begin in a way that misses a few important steps, mm -hmm. retrace your steps and reset. Now that you know, yes. now that you understand, reset. Now mm -hmm. that you understand, even in terms of the art itself, if you understand in terms of the art and you think somehow you don't have to learn to write a short story again, you need to actually make sure that every single day, even if you have two novels, right. read something that speaks about the art of writing. Mm. Read something that talks about uh, how particular authors overcame 
issues that they have. So every every author has their their problem. I had an I had a problem with time, and my editor pointed it out in terms of how you put time together in a story. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you, you you know you confuse time. He said you know you have to you have to make sure that that works uh, so, because people point it out. Right, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the art itself, in terms of the technical side of the art, and then in terms of the business. If it's the business, you have to understand how you're beginning. Are your agents aligned with your publisher or not aligned? And what does that mean? Well, aligned, in, and, and this is my term. It's not an industry term. Mm-hmm. Be certain that your agent is supporting you. Be certain that your agent um, looks out for you first. Mm-hmm. And certainly tries to broker the deals that deal with you as an artist and deals with you as in terms of the remuneration that you must get first. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. I can't claim any absolute, um, you know, very, I can't claim horror stories mm-hmm. in, terms of, in terms of remuneration or getting my due. But, but did so, you have an agent? You didn't, for, the, for your first two novels, you didn't have an agent. From midway into SketchUp, midway mm-hmm. into, after release of Ketchup, I would say I had an agent that was, again, here comes my term, too aligned. Ah, to my okay. Mm-hmm. So and they were looking out for the interests of the publisher rather than you. That's what you felt. Yeah? Sort of arrangement, right? And I, I found that that that's not that's not that doesn't help me to go where I want to go. Right, right. Um, mm-hmm. The reset also includes a new publisher. The reset also, okay. mm-hmm. and I can I can be and I can be, be very candid with you. Um, I've said in in almost every interview that I'm free and single and I'm out on the market. <laughs> and I, I'm saying that very clearly. I'm, I'm not. You sure. hear that, agents? Line yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I'm absolutely um, free and single, and I'm looking for an agent that looks into uh, my work and myself as an artist and where exactly we can go with this. Um, now, you look at all avenues to do this mm-hmm. and I've certainly sent all query letters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've been doing that for, for a, a few years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that once I finished the manuscript and I, I, finished, I finished the manuscript in November last year, a manuscript that was to me satisfactory mm-hmm. as to where I think the story should end. And I, I, I don't think we all agreed where the story should end last night uh, with, with my previous publisher. Mm-hmm. Once I was satisfied and I said, okay, well, you will not miss the Commonwealth deadline. And one of the things that I set down as my rule for 2021 was yeah. you win Commonwealth. Fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. And I, I mean, that would be just so amazing. Uh, talking about um, the the agent, uh, the, the kind of agent you need is a de- is a David Godwin. Sure. He was Arundhati Roy's agent. He's um, the agent of a, because his uh, his approach is he's once he takes a writer on, he is in your court. His job is it's it, he's going to get the best deal possible from publishers. He's not looking out for what publishers want or need he's looking out for you and he will get you the highest possible deal best deal so we need more agents like that you know and talking about the commonwealth short story um prize i think it's it it's it's it has been a remarkable game changer for a number of caribbean writers and even i mean i'd like to go back to ingrid passad because I heard her talk about this in an interview that she did somewhere, I don't remember, but she was talking about how she came to Calabash in 2016, right? And that was the uh, Calabash Literary Festival. That was the year that they were hosting the awards ceremony for the Commonwealth um, Prize. Now, I don't know if it was the book prize at that point or the short story or what, but she was there and she saw these people getting their awards and she found herself thinking, hmm, they look just like regular people. So why can't I do this? I'm sure I can do this. That was 2016, 2017, she won the global Commonwealth Absolutely. Story Prize. 
And yeah. here you are now looking at Ingrid winning that prize in 2017 and saying, hey, why can't I do this? And I, I think I, this is wonderful, so you know? I, I, sent, I sent congratulations to Ingrid on Facebook uh, when she won that prize. Right. Uh, Right. was my year as well um and it was also the year when i've forgotten her name now she won the african prize uh currently there is a there is a a, a disagreement between herself and chimamanda chimamanda used to be her um Mentor. Her teacher, mm -hmm. right her teacher. Mm -hmm. and and i realized just looking all there are many different ways where commonwealth has garnered for itself and a, a particular kind of reputation um, to do this. And I, I really, really salute um, what they've done. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I also felt that it was such a, a wonderful thing to have under your belt, you know. Um, Absolutely. Regional winner, global winner, you know. It, it, you know. So that's um, definitely one of the triumphs of the literary scene. Um, are there any tragedies you can think of? Um, or what, what would you pinpoint? as downers or, you know. The tragedy, and I think, and I, and I, I would hasten to say that the tragedy is something that can be overcome. Mm -hmm. the, the tragedy is also uh, not a tragedy if we understand what we're dealing with and if we put ourselves in the place to change that. This is, I used to be a, a teacher, Annie, um, oh. in high school, I used, mm -hmm. I used to teach high school. I used to teach at, at Kingston College, uh, which is my alma mater. Okay. Mm -hmm. Always tried, like Kwame. I've, I've mm -hmm. heard legends about Kwame Dawes teaching. And, mm -hmm. and, and um, Michael Bennett, you know Mikey. Mikey of course, is. Mikey, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he just has these legendary things to tell you. You have to find a different way to encourage young people to write and to encourage them to write about the voices that they hear, not about, mm -hmm. not about what you think you should write based on what somebody else has written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was nothing in Summer Lightning by Olive Cena that I saw that I thought I needed to replicate, but there certainly was something that says, this, there's a forged stuff here, mm -hmm. which I believe, especially at that time, being in a fundamentalist church, which was confirmation day, and it was about a child not wanting to be confirmed because she just completely did not understand why she was here with bats in the belfry. And across the street, across the street there was a, a, a neon sign saying, enjoy Appleton and drink Sprite, which was like <laughs> all the calling you over there, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. You get the impressions and you get the textures of what Olive is writing, but you certainly don't think you need to write that just because you think, oh, that's what a Jamaican story looks like. Let me write that. Right. You have to find ways to, to, to bring out of each person's experience what it is that really they want to talk about. And, and they're the only ones who can decide that, but you have to tell them it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I so, know what you mean. It's a bit like um, I, I, one thing I do find slightly distressing is, you know, Miss Lou as a model of a uh, certain kind of poetry, and you find a lot of schoolgirls reproducing that as schoolgirls and boys reproducing it but they you know it's like marley right like you know everyone's trying to sing like marley That's however right. his own son the most successful one um what's his name um you know he he does not try and sound like him no and yet right. he's, his music is now killing it right right That's so right. you have to find your own voice you're absolutely right you have to um so so there's there's that kind of mimicry mm -hmm. um i have an incredible respect for kai miller and, and marlon james i read the first i remember reading the first uh page of seven killings and, and drunk with them i always read it always stand in a bookstore don't tell anybody yes. always stand in a bookstore and read the first first page <laughs> yeah to I, see whether you, it what makes you want to read further that's right and at this point mm -hmm. i met Marlon some 20 years 20 years ago um, and I said, oh, Marlon's writing. And I saw John Cook Devil and I read, I read something. And um, I just said, wow, like a paragraph, wow. So the, the tragedy that you spoke of earlier is that we still have many places where persons believe they have to write according to a set pattern of what Caribbean writing is supposed to be. Right, right. That's tragic. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. tragic because we're ever evolving. Mm -hmm. 
when you wrote in the notes of um, pre that had everybody live up to now, when you wrote about uh, a tsunami consuming half of Kingston, mm -hmm. oh, that's what I wrote about. But when you wrote it in the in the in the, in the editorial, mm -hmm. you wrote that. I never thought about it in such a tiny line. Yes. That that's half of Kingston, right. and and yes, mm -hmm. yes, I had. Images. The image that that story began with was standing was was me, in my head, standing at Carib Theater, and hearing um, hearing that the Indonesian um the Indonesian tsunami went two miles in or five miles in what what it was. Yeah. I looked on the map and tried to decide how far that would be from Kingston Harbor. Yes. And I said, well, this is crossroads at Carib, <laughs> and I just imagined that across the Carib we had you know yeah in what you can't imagine. It's a um, horrifying thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. horrifying thought. Um, the cultural, the cultural center is is of Jamaica. A, a lot of them is is downtown. Yeah. I mm -hmm. financial communication, everything. And Western Jamaica. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. like, so I, uh, so the tragedy is that we feel that we have to do this sort of song and dance, maybe for a, a, a tourist gaze or something. And, you know, um, we, we're always looking. We're always being seen under the gaze of, okay, this is what I expect from Jamaica, and therefore we try to write like that. Right. Um, no, uh, if I if I wanted to destroy paradise, I should be able to as a writer, and yeah. I should think of what are the what are the effects that come after the wave, as as I please. So that's a tragedy, but I think it's changing, and and and. Um, there are players who are helping that to change. And I think you're one of them, Annie Paul. I think I've said this to you before. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we employ all the things that say, we now have to form a new thought as to how do we write about Jamaica? Because, you know, the, the Jamaica that harked back to, uh, neo, uh, you know, post-colonialism, um, UK, mm -hmm. et cetera. A lot of that has changed. Yes, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, so- We so have to write the post-colony, which is what we live. We yeah. didn't live in colonial times. And I think though you provided a very important um, clue as to a good way to think about writing or to produce writing, which is that when you wrote um, Sketcher, the voice that you wrote grabbed you because you were writing the kind of child you should have been or you would have liked to be, right? And this is a very, I think, a good and a useful tip to pass on to would-be writers, which is that think about things the way you experience them and then write about them the way you would have rather experienced them, you know? Okay. And maybe that's, that might produce something original and creative and fun to read, uh, as opposed to trying to drearily reproduce your, what, what you're you know, going through. For instance, um, how is it that you, Roland, managed to essentially, you know, transform a, a, a childhood, a poverty-stricken childhood, into magic? You know, how did you do that? That is amazing, and and you are able to inject that because you yourself didn't feel the poverty. You said right, so you you didn't feel like a poor child. However, the circumstances you grew up in were dire, and yet you were able to kind of transcend it and re and write it uh, to illuminate both the conditions, but also getting beyond them. And I think that that is what good writing does. Now, yeah, my next question is one that actually, you know, is derived from you, which is, can a writer at, at home also be in a kind of exile? at home mm -hmm. or do they have to leave in order to be great which is you know which has been the pattern yeah. is that pattern changing of course it is i mean somebody like you actually are a very good example mm -hmm. of breaking that that pattern that has right. Right. been I, with us i i spoke recently to to, to neville bell um at TVJ and, mm -hmm. and just in the morning, just the, the pre-conversation before we began the interview on camera. Mm -hmm. um, he asked me a number of things and, and he, he seemed to, to be um, 
fascinated to use a, a, an extreme word at all of the things that he was reading mm. in terms of profile, you know, mm. um, Musgrave, et cetera, and, and was going through. And he said, you know, I wasn't surprised that he didn't know of me. Um, there were other people who would have within TVJ, you know, daily, et cetera. But I liked that from him as a kind of um, tester because I saw him responding in a, in a, in a very organic way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I think I thought of it at that time, uh, you know, can you be in exile in the sense that you are in Jamaica, but one of the factors that we're so siloed in terms yeah. of information mm -hmm. that we see only particular things. And if, it, if you shout the loudest, then, then you are, you are noticed. You are heard. Uh, mm -hmm. you, if you, if you don't, if you don't absolutely um, become a rabid social media person, then you know you're you're not known um, in a particular way. But you have to at, at a particular in, in some ways that social media person also becomes a a, a sort of um, they're always in your in your in your inbox. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, how do you maintain a presence but at the same time? do what do you do your personality you know etc now i would not have been on social media if it wasn't for literature that's the truth my editor said it to me eight years ago he said you need to be on social media okay right. fine I can, do it. I can do it um but you can be in exile in the sense that one as people continue to discuss uh you don't have the same opportunities um that's Again, debatable, but you know, for the purposes of this conversation, you don't have the opportunities that you could say, well, we're having a, a festival and it's happening in London, we're having a festival that's happening in San Francisco, it's happening in New York, and we'd like for you to attend rather than being passed over because, oh, well, you're all the way down there, therefore, could you do it and what would be the expenses involved, et cetera, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, you can feel like you're in exile because you are in the country which is the cultural perspective from which you write but at the same time you may have the impression that you don't you're not um you're not exposed to the kinds of opportunities that happen uh within the, the context of outside of jamaica mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yeah. i find that not to be daunting at all i find that to be a challenge mm -hmm. and a challenge meaning an exciting challenge to say Am I going to not try to sound like something other than who I am? And like maybe Bob, sing about cornmeal porridge and that, that, that whole notion of cornmeal porridge becomes international. Right. Until people say, well, what is cornmeal porridge? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think you can be a writer in exile. There, there are many different ways. You can be a writer in exile while in your own country. But I think there are many ways to look at it, and I'm not sure that I've explored all of them. Or right. all of them. But I think that's a question which we probably can throw out and see um, who would respond in a way that um, maybe does it even better than I have in terms of what does a writer in exile while well in your own country. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do know writers who have said that, and one that we discussed recently, um, who said, you know, I can't be a writer here. Um, Garfield Ellis, and he yeah. migrated to Canada. But yeah. then you have Erna Broadba, who, who's always lived here yeah. and uh, worked here. So yeah. I, this leads me to my final question, uh, which is that, um, you know, many years, well, I, in a very early interview of yours, you mentioned the fact that you didn't own a Kindle. And yes. I wondered whether you now own a Kindle and also what your relationship to, to the new technologies of writing and reading are. Yeah, I, I, I recently said um, in Global Voices, I said, uh, you know, it, it was a very important question, whether or not, um, whether or not embracing new ways would change Riverbrook. That's a good question. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I love River God. I've actually walked around the River God with the characters a lot. I, I think I think I live somewhere near there. <laughs> in, my, in my head. Yes. My it's not a real place, River God. Not a real place. Right. But but you know, you certainly you have now arranged the geography of the place and you kind of feel like you know it. 
I might spend I, I might spend most of my time at Riggs Bar <laughs> because of being so damn difficult. But um, my relationship with technology is kind of like Riverboat in the sense that you have the dying postal agency mm. where somebody's just there behind the counter as a token, you know. <laughs> And there, right. and right beside, right beside the postal agency is a is a you know a, a, lo a looming um, Tele uh, cell tele phone tower, mm -hmm, right? Which has John Cruz on it, um, <laughs> and, and and how how technology is juxtaposed with mm -hmm. the dying or the old things, yes. you know. It's kind of my relationship with it, with technology. I believe that you have to embrace technology. Mm -hmm. There's no question around it. There's none, and, and, and it doesn't have to be that you're dragged kicking and screaming um, to embrace technology. There's a yeah. lot of very positive things that technology have wrought. Sketcher could not have been written without technology. Yeah. You yes. know, mm -hmm. Sketcher would be impossible. It would not have happened if we didn't have the technology that we have now and had. Right, right. Um, all of these links were made with technology. They would never have had an opportunity if I if I if I had written it in my hand in handwriting and sent it in, mm -hmm. none of it would have happened. Um, so my relationship with it now and and with Kindle, I'm I'm wide open. The only thing about reading on light is that you know is what it does with my eyes. It it tires. It's difficult to read for a long time. Yeah. If you have blue light and you know other things, like blue light filters and helps all a bit. Yes. Yes. So I I absolutely embrace that and at the same time the more i embrace technology the more i now go and research what it is that i've probably not known about the country i live in about the the, the place which was a, where a clash of civilizations happened mm -hmm. um, so i'm doing i'm doing janus i'm doing backwards and forwards i'm looking at the technology but i'm also looking back at who we are and and, and what we've done and what exactly is my relationship to, to all of these things yeah, no, that's wonderful. And so I just want to thank you for this great long conversation that we've had and wish you all the best for the 30th of June when the prize winner, prize winner will be announced. But I have to say you're already a winner. And also that this year, I think the competition is very tough. Yeah. Uh, I read all the stories and they're all good. Whereas there are some years when you wonder like why did this story make it into the top five i didn't feel that way all five of them are really good but you are yours is special and we'll be cheering for you and Watch waving out. our flags and you know rags rags and flags thank That's you right. so much roland watson grant and i look forward to meeting you in person one of these days again to have a drink and celebrate that's right <laughs> also, up. let's close on 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 by uh, mentioning that pre start getting your short stories ready for pre because now from now on, although we will have themes, we're also going to leave each issue open for 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 material that comes in which doesn't necessarily conform to the theme. So you Absolutely. can write whatever you like. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you and bye for now. Bye. Thanks okay. a lot. Yes.